Thanks, Caleb, for the compliment. It it got really, really cold last night here in New Mexico. It's dipped clear down below 69. And so I had to dress warm. It's been colder here lately too. I haven't broken out the hoodie yet though. Well, is it, it must not be colder than 69. Well, it is. We're just used to colder temperatures, I guess. <laughs> Caleb, are you going through the homeworks? Um, to be honest, no, I'm not actually doing them. But I have done problems similar to most of them. So. Well, how's everybody doing today? Good. Yeah, that's good. I'm I'm struggling with your math, Mike. I've I did your readings and stuff, and it's pretty foreign when you haven't taken a math class in 15 years. We're not doing any math yet in this class, are we? <laughs> Wait, Curtis, are why are you wearing a, a jacket? Yeah, it's cold here, Andre. In your house. Yeah, we don't use the heater or the air conditioner this time of year. Oh, wow. Nice. It's, it's been getting down to the end of the fo low 40s here in Utah. I had to pull out extra blankets last night. Jeez, wow. Okay, I'm not. Here it's still in the 80s. Sunbelt states. Woo. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm actually look, really looking forward to this uh, next session. Um, we're going to start diving into some actual little finite element problems. And um, I want to I want to do it in detail. So uh, no, that, that was where the issue was coming in. I tried playing around with it, but I did. I couldn't get anywhere just yet. Dan, was that, were you talking to the class or just not on mute? Yeah, I have a, uh, a file. Uh, there's nothing in it when I open it up though. Hey, hey, Dan Franken, can you mute yourself if you're not trying to talk to everyone? Okay. So let's use the math guys so that you feel like there's some purpose to the misery that you may have been going through. Um, so what we want to do today is solve a very simple approximation problem. And this, this is like the simplest problem that I could think of that has all the elements uh, of the finite element method in like its simplest form. And it will leverage everything that you just learned and hopefully motivate that learning. So let's say we want to solve a problem that looks like this. Okay, we want to find the minimum. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, sorry, things are loading on. I, I named it I output ports. Also mute someone. Well, yeah, actually, can, that, can that can be it. I, I don't believe I can edit my plot file data out. Let's see, gotta hunt him down. I don't <laughs> think he even knows what's good. That, that, that. Yeah. So. Got him. <laughs> nice. All right. So we want to minimize 
we'll find the minimum u in some space v. We'll define that in a minute. In a minute. And then in some norm, u minus f. And let's call this the L, L2 norm. Okay, so we're given some space. Let's say, um, for example, that V maybe is a subset of L2. Okay, so this is all square integrable functions. So it's some subset of L2. It could be an H space, a so love space, or whatever. Okay, that's not really important. And what we want to do is we're given some F. Okay, so we're given some F. Let's say F is, uh, let's just say that F is integrable. Doesn't even necessarily have to be square integrable. Let's just say that it, it, the integral makes sense. So now we have this very simple problem where we want to minimize the distance between some member of our space V and this F that may or may not live in V. Right, so this is like a simple distance minimization problem. Um, so how do you minimize, how do you find extrema of, let's just say classical functions, what do you do? Well, in the past we just used derivatives to find those zeros. Exactly, and that's exactly what we're gonna do in this more complex setting. So let's, let's go ahead and massage this a little bit. So notice that this is always going to, if, if it's not the trivial solution, right, this is always gonna be a, a positive number. So we can square this and not change the, change the answer. So let's, let's rewrite this to be one half u minus f squared. The reason that we like to square it is because if you remember the L2 norm is defined as some integral of u squared and then it's to the one half. And so when you square it, you get rid of this square root, which makes things simpler. Okay, so this hasn't changed the problem at all. And so let's go ahead and write that out in terms of the L2 norm. Okay, so this is now from the math that you learned, you can see immediately that we have uh, a norm squared here. So we have, we know that we're in a Hilbert space. So there's a notion of distance and uh, orthogonality. And so we're gonna leverage it to find the distance between functions. This isn't like just vectors now, these can be any, any object that can live in these spaces. And we know from elementary calculus that if you take the derivative uh, and set it equal to zero, you should be able to find a, a min or a maximum. How do you differentiate between the mins and the maxes? Just FYI. You can see whether it's going from negative to positive or positive to negative. Uh, okay, or you could do what? What's, the simp what's even a simpler way to figure that out? Plug in your values. Just take the second derivative and look at its sign. So you can take a second derivative and you can look at the sign and then um, that will tell you everything you need to know about. Um, and maybe we'll do that about whether it's a min or a max. Okay, so let's talk about uh, differentiation. So now what we need to do is we need to take the derivative of this entire expression with respect to u, okay? So this is a functional or variational derivative. Uh, 
a more, maybe a little bit more rigorous way to think about this is what's called a, a Gateau derivative. Okay, so a Gateau derivative is a, it's the a generalization of the classical directional derivative. So can somebody tell me kind of what a directional derivative is? It's a one-sided derivative um, with the limit only going on one side. Okay, and so if you're in a multi, like if you're in Rn, or R3 or R2, how is it computed? Well, you take the gradient of the function and you, you, you dot it with the direction that you're interested in. So that's kind of the idea or you multiply because that might be a tensor too. So then you just uh, multiply it by the direction that you're interested in looking at the behavior of the gradient. And so what we want to do is we want to essentially compute directional derivatives for every possible direction. And so what we say here is um, if we're given, let's say V and W are Hilbert spaces, And uh, let's say we've got some function m, this is a mapping, a linear operator, that takes v into w. m for us is this integral, okay? And v and w are just going to be L2 spaces. I guess in this, w is the reals in this case. Um, what we say is the Gateau differential Let's call it DM U semicolon delta U and I'll come back to that in a minute of M at U in V in the direction delta u in v is defined as follows. So, dm u delta u is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of m u plus epsilon delta u minus m of u all over <laughs> epsilon is the same as taking the classical derivative scalar derivative with respect to epsilon, because epsilon is just a, a real parameter. M u plus epsilon delta u, and then let epsilon go to zero. Okay, so this shouldn't really be that uh, strange uh, in the sense that it mimics the structure of a classical derivative classical directional derivative, you notice what you've done is, is um, you're looking at the behavior of the derivative in some direction, but now the direction is actually a function, delta u, and then you multiply it by a small parameter and you want to see what happens as that small real parameter goes to zero, which takes this complicated derivative of a functional with respect to a function to a simple re, uh, 
just a scalar derivative with respect to a real parameter epsilon. And so if, um, if dm exists for all delta u and v, then we say that dm is the Gateau derivative. Okay. And if, if the Gateau derivative exists, in other words, the direction for all, dire all possible directions for every delta u that you can pick in V, that directional derivative exists, then, then the derivative exists and that derivative is unique. Okay, so let's come back now to our simple minimization problem and apply a Gateau derivative in order to uh, solve for the minimum. Okay, so we've got um, minimum u and v, one half u minus f squared v omega. Now we want to take the, this derivative. Okay, so how do we proceed? dm, so this is m now, right, this guy right here, this is m, so dm u delta u is going to be d, d epsilon, and then everywhere you see u, you just replace it with u plus epsilon delta u. So that's, that's just kind of a plug and chug thing. So you just identify all the things that have a dependency on the variable that you're differentiating, which in this case is u, and you simply replace it with a variation uh, away from u. So u plus epsilon delta u. So in this case, it's just one half omega u plus epsilon delta u minus f squared. And then we're going to let epsilon go to zero. All right, now this is, uh, this is pretty easy, isn't it? Because you see now that this derivative is just, this is just a scalar, it's just a, a classic derivative with respect to a, a number, epsilon. So let's go ahead and differentiate this. Um, we're going to assume uh, that there's no kind of dependence on u in the integral here. Later on, there will be a dependence, and so there will be something we have to do. But this derivative can we'll take the derivative of this whole thing. It can come inside the integral. So we end up with, right, you take the 2. It's a two cancel minus one, one, and then you work on the inside. So you get integral <laughs> u minus f delta u d omega. So there you go. That is dm. And then this has to hold for all delta u in v. Wow, that's starting to look an awful lot like um, a variational statement, and in fact it is. And so sometimes we call these, so this is the simplest case, but these are often called, um, we'll call these like potential energies. And so physically finding the minimum is like a minimum energy um, setting for the, for the system that you're considering. And so this right here, this guy is what we call the weak form.
Okay, so in this case, this particular weak form is, maybe we'll complete the statement here, it's find u and v such that this guy equals zero for all delta u and v. And so this is just, again, a derivative of a functional set equal to zero to find extremum, but we're having to leverage this Gateau derivative in order to handle this more complex scenario where it's a basically a function of functions. And we call these guys that have this structure, we call them weak forms. And um, so some of you have probably seen that in the literature. Um, let me pause for a moment and see if there's any questions on this. Or any questions in general? Um, my only question is, so in that first one, we take the derivative with respect to epsilon. Wouldn't the u and f kind of be considered um, constants because they're not? connected to epsilon? Exactly. That's exactly right. So the U minus F comes from this, it's, it's the chain rule, right? So you have U minus F and then you take the derivative of U with respect to epsilon, which gives you delta U. So you take this guy here, okay. D, D epsilon of this whole guy squared, right gives you u minus f and then you work on the argument on the inside which there's only oh, one thing that depends on epsilon so it's delta u yeah okay so this is just the chain rule is all yeah. that this is yeah okay that makes sense and where did your one half and in, in your energy integral come from mike uh i just put it there so it canceled with the squared when i took the derivative it doesn't change anything. Uh, it's just cleans up the derivation. Okay, um, so let's take a look at this weak form. So remember, we started with a norm on a Hilbert space and we leveraged, I mean, this is cool because we leveraged the structure inherent in those spaces to now take a derivative we're finding extremum, but all with respect to functions now, right? So we really generalized these basic notions that you have from calculus. And um, really we have not, I would say, changed the mental model that you probably have for these objects, norms, inner products, uh, vector spaces, et cetera. But now we're in a much more generic framework so let's take a look at this for a minute. So let's uh, work on this integral. This is the same as uh, u, u delta u d omega minus the integral of f delta u d omega. What is this thing right here? Anybody know what this is from our previous, the mathematical preliminaries that we just got done with? It's called a symmetric bilinear form. And you can prove this very easily. So this is a symmetric bilinear form. And then what's happening here? Anybody interpret this? The integral of f against delta u. What is this? Don't be shy.
Let me pick on Lindsay. What is this statement doing here? I might need to buy a vowel, Mike. Okay, she wants to buy a vowel. That's a good answer, Lindsay. Well, think about this. So what is the integral? It's just a sum, right? It's like an infinite sum. I don't know, something like that, okay? F and delta U are like vectors of infinite size, right? So these guys would be like, I don't know, maybe we call this, uh, um, this is like a vector, you know, you know, like a vector F1, F2, F3, but it's F infinity, right? That's really what a function is. It's just a vector with an infinite number of components. And so this is really F I delta U I. What, what is this? If this was not infinite, what would you call this, this, this sum? It's an inner product or a dot product. It's a dot product between vectors. Do you see that this is nothing more than F dot delta U it, in this kind of hand wavy way of thinking about things? I'm trying to give you some intuition, right? Like functions are infinite sized vectors, the integral is a sum. So this is nothing more, because we're in a Hilbert space, this is nothing more than what you do with normal vectors, just with different notation. And so what does a dot product do? If I do F, if F and delta U were vectors in R3, for example, and F was in, I don't know, R4, or some other, you know, Euclidean space, what, what does the dot product do? It returns a constant. It kind of, it kind of measures the, how, how far one vector goes in another vector, right? Yeah, so what we're doing, and remember this is for all delta u, okay? So what we're doing is we're saying, what's the component of f in the direction of this delta u? right? And then we take another delta u and we say, what's the projection of f into that delta u? Do you see what we're doing? We're doing a projection of f into v through the application of a dot product, right? So that's what this, this term is. And that makes sense, right? Before we can work on it, we better project it into our space or else we can't compare it to anything. So these kinds of projections are, are all over the place in weak forms where you're taking quantities and you're uh, integrating against test functions. And that's what it's about. It's nothing more than finding the coefficient of F with respect to the base vector delta U in some sense. That's what this is. Okay, what is this? U Delta U, what would you guys call this? Well, in like your first, um, your first mechanics course, probably as an undergrad, you learned about something called a stiffness you guys remember that term, stiffness? When we make this finite dimensional, this is gonna yield what's called a stiffness matrix, which essentially says, how does U respond in every possible direction? That's really what this is measuring, right? Because you don't know U, so you just say, well, how does U respond in every possible direction and then when I compare it to the projection of F into the space, I'll figure out actually what the U is that I'm interested in. That's what this is. And so you ran into this way early on. Uh, you probably ran into it just with a single number, maybe it was called K. Um, but 
in the infinite dimensional setting, that's all that this is, is a matrix. A, ma a matrix with an infinite number of rows and columns. To me, these mental models are very enabling. This is what allows me to uh, think about these problems in a way that's constructive and intuitive is you start to develop, in particular, this link between linear algebra and what we call functional analysis. Analysis, okay. Functional analysis is nothing more, especially if we're talking about Hilbert spaces, everything in linear algebra essentially has a direct analog in functional analysis in the functional analysis of Hilbert spaces where the dimension N goes to infinity. So all of the intuition that you've developed over the years with respect to matrices and vectors in RN, there are direct analogs, but the notation has changed. And that trips up a lot of engineering students is that they don't have any guiding intuition behind the symbols that are introduced. And so that's what, that's what this is doing is it's simply saying, let me project F into the V space that, I'm look, that I can think about. And then I know how U responds in every direction. So let me find the particular U that goes in the direction of the projection of F into the space. And this is often called orthogonal projection. Also is another term that's used. Okay, so what's really cool about this, this is a very simple problem, but we'll quickly move to like what are called strain energies, for example, which can be very complicated um, or other kinds of potentials. Or sometimes we won't even start with a potential and we'll just simply write down the weak form. Um, but the structure of the Hilbert space in which we're looking for solutions allows us to identify complicated strain energies with simple minimization problems with respect to equivalent norms on the Hilbert space. And then your intuition in this simple setting holds over entirely. No matter how complicated the weak form is, these basic intuitions uh, hold over. Okay, so in, uh, let me, any questions? I'm learning that teaching over Zoom is, 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 is kind of lonely. It's like I am talking into the abyss. Are there really people listening? I want somebody to say something so I know there's actually a human being listening to me. Hello. Hello. We're listening. <laughs> We're here. Yeah. All right. Oh, that's comforting. <laughs> I'm really feeling it. You know, I really enjoy the, the, the classroom setting. And it's... it's um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a change. Okay, so let me ask you then, when you have a weak form, if you have a weak form, in this case, our weak form is um, it's u delta u minus f uh, F delta U. Um, hey, Mike, can you remind me of this notation you're doing here with the parentheses and the commas? Uh, Curtis, have you been doing your study? I have, and I'm, I've been confused about it. So this is the note. What was this notation from the previous section? The open parentheses? That's the symmetric bilinear symmetric, form, correct? Symmetric bilinear form. And so, in fact, both of these are symmetric bilinear forms. Uh, the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right is that F is given. And so it's not an unknown. So it's kind of taking up the first slot. So the first slot's not free. You have some given data. But it's still a, it's still a symmetric bilinear form. So an integral is implied then? Um, 
in this case, we know that our, our statements are integral statements. Uh, mathematically speaking, all that we, sh when, when I say that this is a symmetric bilinear form, all that it means is that it satisfies the two properties that I listed previously. So integrals do in fact satisfy that those statements, so they are bilinear forms. But there are other objects that, that may also satisfy those definitions. But yeah, in our case, these are all integrals. Everything is an integral. Okay, so um, the symmetric bilinear form, you might want to ask yourself the question, well, how, how do I know a unique weak solution exists? We're doing all this math and now we have this weak form, but how are we gonna know if this is the case? There's a very, there's a um, very famous theorem. I won't go into the details. You, I have a link to a nice Wikipedia entry on this theorem that if you'd like to look at it, it's called the Babushka Lax Milgram theorem. And basically what it says is, remember this guy, this guy maps to an infinite dimensional matrix, remember? And this maps to an infinite dimensional vector. Basically what the theorem says is if this infinite dimensional matrix is invertible, and in some sense this F vector coming from this function F is well behaved in some way, then you're guaranteed a unique weak solution to this problem. But again, this, this, these analogous concepts between linear algebra and RN and Hilbert spaces is really helpful because they don't say invertibility of matrix matrices, the term that they use for invertibility of these infinite dimensional operators is coercive. So when an operator is coercive, the way to think about that is it's invertible. And you should know if you think about a this is really just least squares. We know that least squares, you know, has a solution. Uh, and so this is nothing more than an infinite dimensional least squares, also known as L2 projection. Okay, great. Now the finite element method, <clears throat> FEA, FEM, FEM, the finite element method always starts with a weak form, always. Okay. Which kind of, you probably are thinking, well, what's the alternative? Well, let me tell you, there's something called a strong form. And let me define that now. Before I, I define it for this problem, let, let's just talk at a high level what, what the term, the word weak, why have we selected that at a high level? What, what is that express? What is it expressing? What's the idea that it's expressing? That the function doesn't have to be defined everywhere. Exactly. These functions can have these weak derivatives. Um, and we have through integration, a way of essentially pulling out these sets of points where we don't really understand what the function is doing in a classical sense. And so we call these weak solutions and therefore they come from weak forms. So with that intuition as a guide, what would you say then is gonna be the high level definition of a strong form?
It is defined. Defined in what sense, though? Like, what is the... There's an exact solution in all locations of space? Yeah, so the, the term that we use is point-wise. In other words, the solution that we find satisfies the equation at every possible point. There are no points where it can be funny, like the absolute value at a point. There's a point, it's kind of a C0 function. There's a point where the derivative's not defined. Uh, that wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to get that in the strong form because it has to be satisfied point-wise. Um, and the weak form, so I, the term I think about in the strong form is this point-wise satisfaction. And so kind of at a high level, the term that I use or that I think about is kind of in the average. Weak solutions are kind of like averaged solutions. And that's what an integral really is, is it's a type of averaging procedure. Okay, so if, if FEM always starts with a weak form, it may be nice to know what's the corresponding strong form. And in fact, in infinite dimensional spaces, there is an exact equivalence between weak forms and strong forms. Meaning if you have a weak form, you can deduce the pointwise equations that are satisfied. And the strong form uh, is often goes by the term Euler-Lagrange equations. Does anybody remember from their this would be, you'd probably see this the first time in like an introductory graduate engineering math course. Remember the Euler-Lagrange equations. If you go and, and look, and I, I, I put a link to a nice description of these, you'll be able to now see what may have been not obvious before, should be very obvious that all the Euler-Lagrange equations are doing is saying, if I start with a weak form, what are the actual point-wise satisfied equations that I solve for if I solve this, this weak form? So strong form is kind of analogous to the Euler-Lagrange equations, and they can be deduced from a weak form. Because remember, FEM, you could just write down a weak form. This is how we design methods. We write down weak forms and add operators for just for numerical purposes, and we do all kinds of crazy stuff to weak forms. And then we always derive the Euler-Lagrange equations for the given weak form to make sure we understand the structure of the equations that we're actually solving numerically. And let me show you how this is done in this particular setting, the simplest setting that I could think of. Okay, so I, I told you that I should be able to derive in the infinite dimensional setting the strong form from the weak form. So the way that you do that is you take a strong form and you isolate all of the test functions. So if, you know, it, it, we'll see this in the future, if your test function is carrying derivatives or whatever, you move all that information off of the test functions onto the actual functions that you're solving for. So in this case, let me do that. So we start with, um, We start with uh, u, delta u, is equal to zero. Now let's write down the integral. Let's combine everything together. u minus f, delta u, d omega, has to equal zero. And this is for any, right? This has to hold for any delta u. So if this equation, this integral statement has to hold for any delta u and I have an infinite number of delta u's to choose from, do you think that I could pick a delta u that's positive on the interval delta or omega? The answer is yes, I can construct one that's positive 
at every point in the domain. If that's the case, then what must I know about U and F? U equals F on omega. This is a point-wise statement now. In other words, if my test space is infinite dimensional, essentially I can filter out all of the information about you there is enough test functions that I can always construct one that filters out essentially at every point the behavior of you. And so the equation that you're satisfying for this integral statement shouldn't be any surprise, it's this. <laughs> That's what L2 projection, the weak form coming from L2 projection, the Euler-Lagrange equations are nothing more then u equals f. <laughs> that shouldn't I'm be not up. following why u needs to equal f due to that equation. I mean, if u minus f and you want it to always be greater than zero, wouldn't u no, 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 be has greater to be than equal f? The integral, the entire integral has to equal zero, but we know that delta u isn't zero. So the only way that the whole integral can be zero if delta u is non-zero is if u minus f equals zero. Okay, that makes sense. And because this is infinite dimensional, we have enough, have enough in there, there that we can make any kind any of kind argument of that we want about like this and deduce everything yeah. about u. And so these are the Euler-Lagrange equations for L2 projection. They're so trivial that we don't even write them down but it's nice to verify that in fact, that integral statement actually means that if I have an infinite number of functions, I should recover the exact pointwise statement that I'm trying to satisfy in the first place. Okay. Now, once we go to finite dimensional test spaces, all of a sudden it goes like this, right? And we'll have to understand that approximation. Okay, this, this step right here, from here to here, is called the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful, isn't it? Okay, and it really is something to kind of sit and ponder for a while. Because again, this is another one of those intuitions that is powerful if you can get your head around what is, what's happening here, right? It's like we have enough functions that when we integrate our equations against those functions, those functions are like little windows into the behavior of our equations. Maybe even at a, and so, a, you know, a test function, really, these are called test functions also. I should have said that, test functions. And the word test has the right connotation here, right? You're testing. And it's like a little teeny bump. A test function, the way to think about it is like a little teeny smooth bump. And it can get as small, it can't be a, a single point, but it can get within epsilon of a single point, and that epsilon can go to zero. Like it can be as infinitely small as you want. And because there's an infinite number of these guys and you integrate against all these tiny little bumps over the whole domain, it reveals the behavior of the equations. And that's why we can then deduce pointwise equations, the Euler-Lagrange equations from these integral statements. And so in finite elements, the way that this works is you have an energy and you'll go to a weak form or you may start with a strong form and go back and forth between the strong form or the weak form. Uh, you can st any of these places are appropriate starting points. And then 
whether you start with an energy, like in structural mechanics, we often start with energies and fluid mechanics, we often just write down weak forms. Uh, but in, um, in any case, it doesn't matter what I give you, I can get all the, I can get the other two no matter what you give me, unless the ener there is no, there may not be a well-defined energy for a given weak form. So that's not always the case, but in structures, it usually is always the case. And so, um, but the finite element method then starts from a weak form and we're gonna use what's called Galerkin's method to make it finite dimensional. Okay, and so for those of you who work with finite elements, I'm sure you've seen this terminology, right? And maybe you're working on really complicated systems of equations. No matter what system of equations you're working on, if it's a finite element method, it, was, it came from some weak form and all of this intuition holds. For, no, for that system of equations. This, this is what finite elements is. It's essentially projection with respect to a given norm. That norm, however, can be very complicated and have physical meaning like strain energy, for example. Uh, but regardless of the complexity of the norm that you've equipped your space with, all of this projection idea uh, holds over. And that, that's really what the finite element method is. Okay, um, so let me stop there. And um, next time we'll pick it up with the Galerkin approximation and then we'll start getting into splines by introducing Bernstein polynomials and approximating uh, problems with those special functions which are the building block of CAD. And so we'll start to tie the two worlds together. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Scott. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.